Welcome to the ATP Project. You're with your hosts, Steve, Elisma, and Matt. And how are we today? Good? Good, thanks, mate. How good. I'm good. Yeah, I've, got my, good. I've got my addiction here, and you've got your addiction there, because today we're going to be talking about addictions. Should have, should have caught that better. There we go. We're going to be talking about addictions today, and we're going to be talking about how it affects the brain and everything about addictions, and which addictions are we going to be focusing on. We're going to be focusing on things like food addictions, caffeine, drugs, of course, and all the weird addictions that we all get, whether it be caffeines and other stimulants, and also why some people get addicted to something and why people don't, because there are people who aren't addicted, um, but there are people who are easily addicted. And we're going to be talking about the definitions of addiction, you know, what is an actual addiction, because without water, I die. I'm sure without food, you die. Yeah. Without oxygen, you die. Mm. So we are addicted already, but that's not an addiction, which is what we're going to yeah, be talking right about on. today. So. We're going to be talking about how it affects the brain from a neurochemical point of view. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about the eight neurotransmitters in the day. We're going to pick on one of them, which is dopamine. Yep. We're going to pick on dopamine today, but that's not the only one associated with addiction. Um, but Matt, um, I want to try to you first because yeah. I want to talk to you about the, the, the elephant in the room, which is food addictions, because it's 2013. There was, um, Are you a referring to me as the elephant <laughs> in the room with the food addiction? <laughs> Sure, that's how I just got introduced. It didn't, in this didn't program. come across like that, did it? No, that's why I heard it, but that's probably why I'll now eat myself into a, <laughs> into a stupor and cry myself to sleep and then wake up with remorse and guilt. Oh, and it's terrible. I feel bad. Oh. Now. But I've got some good news for you because food addiction is no such thing according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Number 5, oh. which is 2013. They just said, no, nope, it doesn't exist anymore, which is oh, ridiculous. Great. So I'm just weak. Yeah, now, yeah. There's something you said already, Steve, of which I want to talk more about mm. because you mentioned that we talked about addiction somehow evolving around the brain. Yes. And specifically mentioned the brain mm. many times. Mm. And then you called me the fat elephant in the room and said, <laughs> I've got a food addiction. So then, then I got mildly offended because yeah. I possibly have dopamine disorders and yes. that sort of stuff, low self esteem, reward, and pride issues. And we're going to talk more about how dopamine affects all those. Uh, mood and pride and reward centers and mm -hmm. everything in your brain a lot more today mm -hmm. and the other chemicals that work in combination with it mm -hmm. but we're also going to talk about where these chemicals come from and we're going to talk about the whole concept of um, psychology and how psychology went to somatopsychic or psychosomatic mm. as insinuating that one one came first insinuating that the body affecting the brain or the mm. brains affecting the body where with psychology it's kind of all happening at once yeah. and the cool thing about that is it's not just a genetic defect where you have certain chemicals that work in your brain and certain ones that don't that make you predisposed or you know just destined to be an addict mm. you know mm. in this instant what we're looking at is there's things that can occur within your body that can manipulate your reward centers your brain we can have passengers such as the microbiome we can have enzymatic defects nutritional deficiencies we can have genuine needs for things like water and food mm. and that sort of thing so we're going to talk about the holistic nature of addictions because it's not just a weakness in your brain mm. your brain there's no pain receptors in your brain it's got no no muscular function so it, it meant when your brain does things it manifests as thoughts and actions and cravings and mm. um, where if your muscles defective you'll get a pain or you'll get a cramp or <clears throat> We've got to stop realising that our brain is um, in control of anything, really, because it's all happening at once. Mm. So it's so important for us to understand with an addiction, it's, an holistic, um, it's a holistic issue. And if we are addressing just the brain alone and try to modify brain chemistry with brain chemistry modifiers and not actually looking at the individual, their microbiome, their enzymes, their nutrients, their past experiences, their histories and all that sort of stuff. You're never going to break the cycle. Mm. You're just working on one part and if the rest is still out of whack, it just keeps knocking it out of whack. And it's, so. it's incredible. And, and so, Elizabeth, you're still in clinic. You still see patients. Say mm. someone's addicted to something. Why can't you just say to them, hey, stop taking that drug or stop eating that food? Well, because, um, Steve, we, you know, we've often looked at addiction as a psychological issue, yeah. which we've just talked about, but it's in fact more of a physiological uh, condition. And that should encourage everyone because it means that you can actually do something about it. If you start to change the biochemistry that's driving the addiction, that will, 
that will enable you to um, do the psychological things a lot more easier because it's not a mind over matter thing. There are very real biochemical things happening in the body that's driving addiction and that can create addiction. Mm. And so, um, you know, if if you can identify what is the, um, I guess, the blocks in the pathway in that particular person, then it goes a long way into helping them with their um, addictive behavior. So in clinic, that's the way that I would look at it from a physiological point of view. Um, and yeah. again, so many things can be involved. The gut microbiome, mm. diet, um, insulin, there's so many things that can play a role there. Well, that's fascinating because, I mean, we, we have, you know, humans are generally addictive to certain things. But, but the big million dollar reason is why have we evolved like that? Like why have, do we have this potential to become addicted to certain drugs? Is there a benefit for humans being addictable or risk takers? Well, that's, you know, that goes back to that dopamine neurotransmitter, which is a brain chemical yep. um, that, that we make. And it's the chemical that makes us feel great. <sighs> uh, it's a reward chemical. Mm. So it's Every, everything we do in life is mm. all about getting that reward. Mm. So whether it's our job, our exercise, our food, we all want to do things that makes us feel good. So mm. dopamine is the chemical that makes you get out of bed and you're mm. motivated. You want to jump out of bed. You're enthusiastic. Mm. Um, it's what drives us. And specifically from a caveman point of view, dopamine is the chemical that actually drives us to want to look for food and to make the effort to look for food in times of um, in, in harsh conditions, so like mm. famine or anything like that. So dopamine makes us not give up. It makes us, you know, we get up, we keep going, and we, we look for food. Uh, if we didn't have dopamine, we'd all just like, oh, well, and we'll all just starve to death. Mm. So dopamine keeps you keeps driving you mm. the problem comes when you know there's certain areas of that dopamine system that can go wrong and if it does and you're not getting that reward you're not getting that feel good feeling you're going to want more you're going to want more you're going to want more you're going to start looking for activities that's going to give you that mm. and that could be anything you know gambling shopping um eating uh, eating you know the wrong foods alcohol drugs and sex even so you get you know sex addiction as well so anything that you you just keep on looking for any activity that will give you that feel good feeling because mm -hmm. that's what that's what we all want is and a is feel -good it feeling is it always a feel good um stimulus or is it sometimes what about fear what about adrenaline like what about uh um, yeah extreme sports or you know that sort of stuff yep there is and um, can you explain a little bit more about dopamine in regards to the different types? Because I'm familiar, like we're talking about addictions and these people have got dopamine deficits or something. Mm -hmm. um, how is that different to something like Parkinson's disease where they've got like dopamine problems and they can't function? They're all stuck and stiff and rigid. Is there different forms of dopamine doing different things in our body? It is, yes. Yeah. So dopamine, it's one chemical, mm. but it works in different areas of the brain. Mm. So the motor control area, which is more involved in Parkinson's, um, it's in a different area of the brain. I think Substantia I wrote Substantia nigra, if That's you want to look one. that up. Sorry, Substantia Rindu. nigra, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're talking about addictions, that area, that reward system occurs more in the mesolimbic area of the brain, which is in the um, uh, ventral tegmental area of the yeah. midbrain. So it's... The the same chemical but it's just where it works in different, different areas of the function. brain yeah so yeah. Yeah. an interesting story i remember and when i was in the in one of the textbooks i love some of the stories they put in the textbooks um but in, in amongst the textbooks on parkinson's they told a story about a case where this person was extremely bad parkinson's but their house caught on fire and through the in the middle of the fire they got up and ran out and they said that the amount of dopamine and that wow. as part of a survival response, the flood of dopamine was enough to get them to actually move. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about, so for someone with an addiction and that sort of stuff, so some of these extreme events, the risk, talking about risk taking, you mm. know, like mm. full on fight or flight. So this has to be linked back into, you know, caveman days and evolution and mm. you know, fighting lions and tigers to get mm. to steal their food or something. Mm. You That's know, right. So. I think Steve told me about a, an interesting thing that he read about Africa and where, um, you know, the, uh, the Bushmen, when they, um, you know, when they had to feed the tribe, they would uh, engage in risk behavior such as uh, taking the uh, prey off the lion in yeah. order to feed the tribe. So, Shit, I was only joking then. That's, it's true. Yeah. Fools. Uh, well, 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 they just go get their own food. Because well, <laughs> they can't catch the hyenas or whatever the hell they're, mm. they're trying to kill yeah. to eat. The deer, they're too fast for humans. Yeah. So the lions would get them... And and then they would engage in the lions and yeah. they would then steal their food and get a huge dopamine relief because they've got their food. Yeah. And it's like, yes, we won. We beat the lions. That's a massive 
reward your chemicals going wow magic, Shit, magic. yeah yeah and it's like you know I'm still it, alive is what i'd be like Ooh. yeah now now you've, you've, you've <laughs> got a, right. you've got a work trip to vegas coming up yeah yeah but why'd if you do those little bunny things? because work trip to vegas doesn't sound like people are going oh yeah work trip but it is actually a work trip to vegas but if you're in vegas and you've got ten thousand dollars and you chucked it all on red there's just a, about a 50 percent chance you would double your money no actually steve it's 99 percent chance i'm losing that money. <laughs> <laughs> all right there's a what well well let's think but of the, for everyone else yeah, yeah, across yeah. the population that hasn't used up their bullshit quota early yeah in life. exactly so yeah. so that's a that's a risk reward i mean if you're engaging lines you could die but if you you could lose all your money but you could double your money yeah you could get yeah. all the food that's a that's why we get to become addicted to seeing things like gambling yeah right which are, you know those sorts of things it's a it's a it's a risk reward and, and it's the risk it's like when i was a kid my big scar here was trying to jump four rubbish bins on my push bike and because oh, yeah. i did three and um you know of course the next thing is four and after jumping three i remember the reward going oh my god this is awesome i can do four yeah. put another one there and we had to steal one from up the road and i tried to jump four it didn't work at the end it came came a guts yeah, and stacked scar, and yeah. Yeah. yeah so it didn't work out but the, the, that was the pushing myself to the limit, if you want to call it that way. So Which is where we get like exercise addictions and that sort of yeah. thing. It's different extreme sport mm. addictions. You know, the, the big wave surfer guys and mm. the, even the fighters and that sort of mm. stuff, they just get fully addicted to mm. that. Yeah. But that's different to the people like you guys that go for a run and feel nice. So endorphins is that mm. from exercises. Is that an addictive substance as well, or it, is it is it the dopamine from getting scared? I guess it could be both. Like you know, with athletes, you do get that dopamine rush, and I think that's one of the reasons why you you'll see a lot of athletes who retire, um, they end up with addictive behaviors. Yes, I mean, yeah. I think Grant Hackett is an example, but a mm-hmm. lot of them fall into alcohol or drugs, and it's because they're not getting that dopamine surge anymore from yeah. their exercise, so they're looking at, for it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. But certainly, endorphins play a role as well. Um, but your endorphins is actually plays more a role in um, specific food addictions. Yeah. So when you are craving a specific food like bread or mm. whatever, yeah. that's more your endorphins. Okay. When you crave, when it's it's not a specific food craving, you'll eat anything that's in the food cupboard. Yeah. That's a dopamine. That's mm. more driven by dopamine. Yeah, so right. yeah, you can get both of those those systems. And there. do you have physical symptoms with an addiction as well? For example, you get the craving, but do you also get the shakes? Do you get you're frothing yeah. at the mouth and all whatever, Absol- you know? <laughs> well, yeah, you can... Like, is that linked the- in with the dopamine sort of stuff? Or yes. are we... Yeah, cool. Yeah, so you can get the anger, the mood swings, mm. violent behavior, aggressive yeah. behavior, but you can also get... Um, uh, yeah, like shaking and, um, you know, it's like the, t- the typical withdrawal symptoms. Mm. Yeah. And, and some of those extreme acts of violence and some of those extreme acts of violence and sexual disgustingness and that sort of stuff at some of these drug addicts and that sort of stuff will do it doesn't even seem to touch the sides mm. they don't even seem yeah. to have remorse are they mm. so what happens when we use these drugs do we get like a massive release of dopamine and then the dopamine receptors are just smashed or is yeah. it that we so is it that the antennas get cooked or is it that the the chemicals run out or is it a bit of each? It's a little or? bit of both. So yeah. initially you get the surges of dopamine, but eventually you can end up with a dopamine resistance the same as you can get an insulin resistance. Yep. So the receptors become numb or yeah. desensitized. Because the receptors can't stop the release directly. All they yeah. can do is desensitize to it. They can just say, yeah, desensitize. That's, just that's yeah. right. Yeah. So then you need more and you need more and you need more. Now, eventually you can actually, comp- you, you, you run into a dopamine exhaustion. Mm-hmm. Now, when you run into a dopamine exhaustion because you're, you're pumping out this dopamine to get a response, that's when behavior becomes uncontrollable. So that's when you get the binge eating. And, okay. and you know, that's sort of like at that point, there is the, the, the control has been lost to a large degree. And then you have a whole other uh, set of problems that sort of like follow on from that. So that's when depression and stuff like that will sort of like set in. So mm. this is where I get, you know, when you look at the biochemical pathways and I'm going, okay, cool. So for me, as a very, if I was to be, um, a specialist or if I was to focus on one particular pathway I'd think okay well I can supplement my tyrosine here mm. if I give someone tyrosine I'll just make them eat tyrosine um, tyrosine is going to convert to dopamine so that's solved that problem yep. however in reality if you really look at a couple of other biochemical pathways at the same time you'll see that tyrosine is directly linked with phenylalanine or they, yes. they interchange so basically if you're deficient in tyrosine your body will break down phenylalanine and phenylalanine 
it's hard to say, but it's also linked in with endorphins and enkephalins and mm. it raises your mood, raises your pain threshold. Um, that's the endorphin and keflin link after exercise. Alternatively, tyrosine can go down a pathway um, for noradrenaline, norepinephrine, um, which is adrenaline. Yes. So that's our nervous response mm. to stress. That's associated with anxiety and worry. Or tyrosine can go down dopamine or it can go down a melanin pathway. Yep. And mm. So if someone's got a dopamine receptor deficit, their body's asking for more and more dopamine just to register – when we consume tyrosine naturally in our diet, what's happening here? Is it likely to be going down that pathway or, or is, it, is it all starting with our tyrosine going down an adrenaline pathway and not a dopamine pathway? Or how, do, how do we use tyrosine in this situation is probably a better question. You well, know? You know, tyrosine has got a lot of things to do. Yeah. It's got to go to the thyroid. It's got yeah. to, um, uh, like I said, to the uh, adrenals uh, to make that norepinephrine and it also has to go and make dopamine. Um, so it's got a few areas to go to and it's not always just as simple as eating or taking a tyrosine supplement because tyrosine still has to, um, you know, be processed into dopamine. And so there, there's a lot of things that can interfere with that, like, you know, gut dysbiosis can interfere with that because it will, um, you know, it interferes with a lot of um, amino acid absorption, but also um, um, uh interferes with a lot of the enzymes that is involved in converting that tyrosine down into now, dopamine. Mm. This is really important. We'll expend a little bit more on this because we're talking about oral supplements. Mm. So when we take these things, we're taking them into our digestive tract. Before we get them, our bugs get them. That's they, right. They can, they, it's really... So what the bug's going to do to tyrosine... Is dopamine made in the tummy and then sent to the brain? You know, we often talk about 80% of the serotonin in the brain yes. comes from the gut. Is Dopamine the same, or is no? The, the from from my understanding, it it it's not uh, manufactured in the gut. Mm. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to be pr- no, no. It's it's manufactured in the glial cells in the brain. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so which are uh, sorry, glial cells are the cells that stick the brain together. Glial is Latin for glue. If oh, you, really? If you, yeah. I if didn't know that. That's oh, really cool. That is cool. I'm full of useful facts. Yeah, good work. Useless facts. Sorry, is what I'm to say. Uh, it's funny you mentioned about the biochemical with tyrosine before. There was a movie made about this called Awakenings. Does everyone remember that one? Yeah, I do. About 20 years ago. I'll throw a ball at you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah right. Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And in 1969... The funniest thing is... Sorry to interrupt that's again. Right. <laughs> I always interrupt Sam. But he always <laughs> says really funny things and doesn't know. Imagine in that movie that every other morning he just walked in and threw a ball in their face. <laughs> <laughs> just like, it might have been the thing he's doing, just Frank throwing balls at people. And that was so they caught it. He's got him onto something. There you go, he's onto something. And he was onto something because in, in 1969, I was born, right? That was one famous discovery. The other one was the discovery of levodopa, which is the direct precursor to dopamine. Yep. And Robin Williams, the character, I can't remember his real name. Steve. Uh, yeah, whatever he was in the movie. Yeah. And he, he was a doctor who said, well, hang on, these guys are low in dopamine. What if I give them levodopa? And of course it failed. And, but then he gave more and more and more. And eventually the, it worked. The, it worked perfectly where they actually had a 100% cure rate. Yeah. Um, so they all got out of their wheelchairs and were dancing around as the movie goes. Unfortunately, of course, they reverted right back because the receptor's down-regulated. Levodopa is also a pro-oxidant. So it became, it, it became oxidised, killed the brain off, so they, they didn't get better in the end. Mm. However, to this very day, 50 years later, levodopa is still used as a medicine mm. in hospitals. And in so, the natural world, macuna prurians and velvet bean yeah, are used as a levodopa. But what does it do? Does it just... So it's a precursor and then dopamine gets released. Yes. So what does it say? Tyrosine gets absorbed. When we eat tyrosine, we absorb tyrosine mm. out of our digestive tract. It finds its way through the blood-brain barrier, <clears throat> gets into these gluey cells in your brain, and then it converts it to L-dopa. Mm. Yeah. Is that what we're talking about yes. for dopamine? Oh, dopamine That's right. dehydrogenase. Unless yeah. we're really worried and really stressed and anxious and it might go down to the norepinephrine yes. pathway. That's right. Or if we're got some thyroid inefficiencies where we're having to make lots of thyroid hormone because we have too much of a thing like reverse T3 or mm. something like that and it's mm. trying to compensate for the hypothyroidism. It might go down that pathway. That's mm. right. What are the other things that might determine? Let's talk about these gut bugs. Which are the assholes that sabotage our tyrosine? Oh, well, lots of them. Lots of them, but clostridia is a common one. Yep. Um, so clostridia yeah. difficile. Yep. Um, interfering, or we sort of briefly mentioned it in one of our previous podcasts, interferes with that dopamine beta hydroxylase pathway, mm-hmm. uh, which can then cause a, a you know, result in a 
a buildup of dopamine which can then downregulate those receptors in the long run. So, mm. uh, because it, you know, this Clostridia difficile produces a byproduct called f- for cresol in the gut. Yeah. And then that's, that for cresol is the metabolite that interferes with that enzyme, that dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme. And why exactly. does it make it? Like, is it? Do, yeah, you, do you know? Yeah, it makes it you because asked them? I've never asked them, <laughs> hey, but apparently, <laughs> apparently they make it to kill off other species yeah. so they can be the king of the mountain, so to speak. Right. But what is it? How does it kill them? Does it interfere with their energy production? Yep. So that four cresol interferes with the metabolism of other gut bacteria, yep. but unfortunately, because also of interferes. their Krebs cycle, yeah, because it interferes yeah. with their Krebs cycle, huh? That's right. So in an organic acid test, I don't even call it oat anymore. In an organic acid test, you can actually measure cresol in the urine. Yes. So if that, and you you see a lot of it. Mm. Like it's not, it's not just like some people have a little bit. There's that's a significant amount. So if we can measure cresol in the urine, then it means that we t- the tyrosine from our food is getting eaten by things like clostridium. Yep. It's making a poison that damages a Krebs cycle, which yep. is our energy production prediction. Energy production pathway in every cell of our body, and then it ends up in the urine. So it's going all through our body and, and contributing to fatigues and that sort of stuff. Yep. And trying to just stop us from being competition to the Clostridium's food supply. Yep. And, and the problem with that, of course, is that the, the, the treatment for that, the medical treatment, not our treatment, the medical mm. treatment for that is amphetamines, which is one of the most addictive agents known to man. Mm. They give kids amphetamines. And is that to because dro- of negative feedback then? Why do they do that? Because we're talking well, about the... Oh, do you want me to explain? Oh, like, let me, let me <laughs> not <for> interrupt. <laughs> okay. Well, they give them amphetamines because it, it pushes dopamine past that to adrenaline norepinephrine. It clears the excess dopamine. Yeah, well, Because wow. it turns into adrenaline noradrenaline. So you have to give these, these treatments. Uh, Ritalin's a common uh, yeah. amphetamine. Yeah. And they give it to kids in the morning so as it drives through their adrenaline pathways in the afternoon. Uh, or the other option is they go for a bike ride. Yeah, right. So I'd and give them amphetamines. That's cool. what I choose. Of course, that's a that's you a know, good option. You know, go for option. a bike ride. Not, not my bike riding, but normal bike <laughs> yeah. riding or exercise. But a lot of kids so these days... So is there any negative feedback with them? You know, like, for example, I'm just talking oh. about... I'm just... My brain's down this tyrosine pathways now. And I'm imagining if we've got an agent in there affecting mm. the norepinephrine, the noradrenaline actions, mm. Mm. will there be negative feedback to say more of that tyrosine that you've eaten is available for dopamine or... No, no, they, they, know, they, these like, people have too much dopamine in their brain that yeah, blocks right. it off. It blocks it off. So they give them amphetamines yeah. to drive dopamine through to adrenaline because dopamine is the precursor to adrenaline. Yeah. So uh, that gets the kid actually, you know, doing shit. Yeah, right. uh, uh, so the, the problem with that, of course, the amphetamines are highly addictive. Mm. Highly yeah. addictive. Yeah, yeah. So the kids can't get off them yeah. unless they do some sort of intense exercise, which has been shown to yeah. get, get, get their need for amphetamines. But um, you've got to remember the kids are different these days like you know because they're they're less because of you know lots of good reasons like you know it's a bit more dangerous out there actually it's safer out there for kids mm. weirdly the studies show but a lot of kids are uh, are being a little bit more protected they're, they're not having as much activity because there's more games around there's you know these sorts of things like in my day you'd be you'd have to walk to school and yeah. now they get driven to school and there's cars yeah. everywhere it just wasn't yes. the case so there's, there's something interesting about the Ritalin, um, Steve, that I thought would, you know, is worth mentioning because you're right, like, you know, they have too much dopamine mm. and then they use that to sort of like push that through. Yeah. But what we also have to remember is if we look at our neurotransmitters, it's like we have these little levels in our body. So in other words, an ideal level of dopamine may be here. Mm. Now, these kids have always had a lot of dopamine. Their mm. ideal level sits there. That's mm. the level that they're always striving towards. So now we are giving them drugs like, 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 like Ritalin, which then drops the dopamine down to normal levels but yeah. for him that kid it's not normal yeah that's right which means they even though it's pushing it through they want that level and mm. so that's why a lot of these kids then can sort of like uh, get more into addictive kind of behaviors yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's a, a side effect of some using something like and a lot of obsessive compulsive little they do mm. yeah, they, they get ocd yeah. yeah. tracked yeah. and these 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 kids nowadays can sit on a screen for like six to yeah. eight hours now whereas in the olden days you couldn't do that but now with their addictive no, personality in the old days they didn't have the screens they had newspapers yeah <laughs> <laughs> they Can't do. talk to my dad every Sunday. I'm reading the newspaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Uh, so, yeah, so, they, today. so they're giving them these highly addictive <laughs> drugs that, that, and a lot of the footballers were on the, uh, the yeah. Ritalins and amphetamines too because they had ADHD. Yeah. So, you know, and of course, you know, this is also now crept into autism spectrum too. Mm. So they're giving these amphetamines to autistic kids. Yeah, right. So it's a, and, and of course, this is a highly addictive drug. It's yeah, very yeah. addictive amphetamines, yeah. and they're giving it to overweight people. Yeah. who don't exercise. So when you get, I've always wondered this because I've seen it a little bit in the clinic. 
when they finish school and then they become adults and stuff like that, all of a t- sudden they don't have a learning and behavioural disorder anymore. You know, now that all of a sudden we're diagnosed with something else, you know, anxiety yeah. or bipolar or depression. Mm. It's just a non it's just an ongoing process, mm. hey? Yeah. So so far, if we were to have a look at it, we're looking at the gut and the microbiome, make sure there's no things like clostridium that is reg- as hijacking your tyrosine. Mm. And clostridium is the most common cause for clostridium is antibiotic mm. use. Mm. So a lot of people um, end up with an overgrowth of that because of recurrent antibiotics because mm. of... That's why you often see links, I believe. This might be a little bit of a stretch or a theory of mine as well, but there's a lot of statistical links talking about inner ear infections that mm. linking into behavioral disorders mm. and early life events like that. And then maybe the antibiotics and the altering of the microbiome might even have something to do with that um it does actually so we look at things like clostridium also look at other bugs like candidas and the mm. firmicute overgrowth and cybo and dysbiosis when yep. we're talking about sugar addictions talking about cravings of certain foods the microbiome i have no idea how they do it but they tell us what to eat and they want us to eat mm. what they need and like I, I spin out like if you consider things like um how amazing these microbes are like if you look toxoplasmosis you know it'll infect a rat and make the rat look for cats so the cat eats the rat yeah so it can spread the infection rabies makes is transmitted through saliva and somehow affects the brain of these things and makes them want to bite things with frothy salivary mouth mm. like it's a, how a little microbes can take over our brain and make us do stuff i honestly believe we are just vectors for transport for those bugs absolutely um so what else can we talk about with the gut? Because oh. I believe we've got massive links in there with the neurotransmitters and how we deliver those neurotransmitters to the brain. Mm. But when we're talking about food addictions, mm. since we addressed the elephant in the room quite early, anywho, <laughs> gut. Gut, yeah. When I'm hungry, my tummy's growling. <laughs> you know, that's so how that's I remembered a- it at uni. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a ghrelin hormone. That's right. Uh, just for those people who don't know that. That's so let's what. talk about the micro, let's talk about how your gut makes you crave stuff. Oh, that's, surely it's huge. I'm, I'm just thinking maybe with food addictions, it's not just your brain. I'm going to hold this up so people see how the gut affects the brain in in one snapshot. I can't believe I found this paper. Uh, it just goes through absolutely everything. But it's not going to shock you to know that the, the bad foods like sugar, food additives, and antibiotics adversely have caused neuro inflammation in the brain, and that causes addiction. Oh, okay. Hugely, of course. And, so and inflammation, up, oxidative yep. stress. Yep, but it also releases norepinephrine from the gut, which affects acetylcholine, which, which activates the sympathetic nervous system, which drives the brain chemicals into a stress response, which yep. you don't want, because stress in the brain means low dopamine, high stress, because it comes from dopamine, your adrenalines. So you get this massive response from all these bad foods. Weirdly, probiotics, prebiotics, fermented foods, all the the healthy gut foods, I guess you want to call them that. So there's just a few examples of them. Obviously, we're more into the polyphenols for the gut. Uh, they have a positive effect on the gut and via the hypothalamic pituitary um, glands, the sex glands and the adrenal glands uh, cause the stress in the gut from those particular bad foods. Sure. So it is huge. It is like... You, you, There's a you lot know. of factors. And so when I'm looking at that one chart, you're looking at yeah. immune. So yep. you've got a <clears throat> you've got imbalanced mucosal immunity, you're going to be predisposed. Yep. If you've got an overgrowth of those bugs that may be causing that imbalanced immunity, you've got big problems. It's via the um, astrocytes in the brain of the cells that affect this inflammation. Yeah. Now for those, you, you like the glial cell stories, do you know why they're called astrocytes? Because they're shaped like stars. Really? Yeah, yeah. they've got little, oh, they, they look like stuff. a star. Yeah. So I love the stories because yeah. I remember it then. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's cool. So, so they do look like stars. There's yeah. one there. So, so you know, they look like stars if you can imagine that. We'll get a picture up on the screen. Oh, so, so that star. that's what an astrocyte <laughs> is. And um, you know, if if you get lots of inflammation in these particular cells, you get a brain cancer called an astrocytoma, yeah, which right. is pretty much fatal. You can get gliomas too; they can be fatal too. Yeah. So you don't want any inflammation in your brain. No. And it's, so, and we talked about. You mentioned that these hydroxylase enzymes, they're the ones that do the conversion. Mm, they don't yep. really work real well in exposure to inflammation and oxidative stress no, at all, do they? Exactly. So you have all your hydroxylase enzymes, which is where our neurotransmitters, you know, our serotonin and our dopamine are made. And those hydroxylase enzymes are very sensitive to oxidative stress. So mm. oxidative stress is gut dysbiosis, you know, uh, even stress uh, will create oxidative stress, mm. um, you know, toxicity, anything like that will, will in, down-regulate a lot of those enzymes will make yeah. them not work so great. And another 
mechanism why diet causes addictive behaviour is, is, is summarised in this beautiful sentence from uh, Clinical Chemistry 2018 for those who are taking notes at home. It says, high glycemic index carbohydrates elicit a rapid shift in blood glucose and insulin levels akin to the pharmacokinetics of addictive behaviours. Okay. Uh, and also akin to drug abuse, glucose and insulin signals in, in the mesolimbic system in the brain to modify dopamine concentration. Yep. So the sugar changes changes the dopamine in the brain. Absolutely. Yeah, sweetness. Yep, sweetness. Because the there's no sort of calories. <clears throat> yeah. There's no feeding of bacteria as such. Well, they, they, gave, they gave sweetness to rats in a study and yeah. it did cause addictive behaviour dramatically yeah, really? in rats. They, the rats went nuts. Now, the reason why they know that their dopamine receptors downregulated is simply because they cut the brains open afterwards. So you can't do that in a human. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. well, you know, but no, it's not allowed. So they did that in rats. So they actually showed that the dopamine receptors were changed when they gave them artificial sweetness. Yeah. Wow. So it's very interesting. So it's not just the calorie association. No. It's actually no. that, that, that... Absolutely addictive. I suppose we start tasting the sugar well before we're getting the sugar and preparing for the sugar. So the, the biochemistry associated with a sweet taste mm. is all anticipation to the, the glucose coming in mm. and it changing those things. So if I've got a food addiction and that sort of stuff... Um, where does ghrelin and leptin, because we talk about ghrelin and leptin mm. with compulsive eating when we're talking about weight gain and that sort of stuff. So yep. ghrelin makes me hungry, doesn't it? It makes my yes. stomach growl. Yeah. That's why I always remember it. So ghrelin makes you crazy hungry. And leptin is supposed to reduce your satiety. Oh, sorry, increase your satiety, reduce mm. your hunger and burn. Mm. That's right. So leptin is like, resistant. you know, it, it regulates the energy uh, in mm. the body. So mm. when it registers that there's enough energy in the body and we don't need to eat more, then leptin will send the signal to the brain to say, mm. you've had enough. And that's a satiety signal that we yeah. get if, if it all works well. But if you have leptin resistance, which is a consequence of insulin resistance, so, mm. you know, when we talk about eating sweet stuff and, and all the carb foods, stuff, the high yeah. GI foods, eventually leading to... Insulin resistance, which then leads to leptin resistance, and that leptin resistance interferes with dopamine transporters. It downregulates dopamine transporters, and so that in itself can also feed back into uh, addictive behaviors as well through that mechanism. Yeah. But the ghrelin is an interesting one because usually what will happen is when we, um, you know, we have our, um, you know, when we eat food, ghrelin is the in Cretan or the gut hormone that triggers dopamine release in the brain mm. and that's why that's where we get the joy from food so yeah, that's just right. like oh yeah that was a great meal and you know you get the the joy not just the satisfaction but the joy from eating yeah. and so if that grilling mechanism is not working very well so that's why if you get really hungry mm. you get really hungry and then you eat something it's just like so good yeah so the ghrelin's that's, there priming the dopamine sections yep. to just be like that's this right. Is fantastic food. And, and, and as, as you're off to America, if you happen to go down south, they call that sort of food comfort food. Have you ever heard that term? Oh, I have. Yes. I've even heard soul food. Soul food, exactly. Oh. Mm. And, have and you I, heard that term? Yeah. You've heard of comfort. I don't know if it was a well known <laughs> thing out there. I watch a lot of travel <laughs> cooking shows. You're just a smart ass. Don't know. <laughs> so, so these comfort soul foods that you see, you know, cooked in the south of America, yes. they, they are supposed to elicit this dopamine response, which is good and bad. Because if you feel good after eating a food and it's too good, you can get an addictive behavior. Like yes. you, you, a lot of people who eat a lot of sugar um, feel good after eating a lot of sugar. And like they go, oh, wow, I feel great, you know, like after a load mm. of caffeine. That's a psychological addiction and a physiological addiction at the same time. Mm. Yeah, right. Because you search for that good feeling again. Mm. Yeah. And last time you ate, you know, I don't know, sugary fudge and you feel really good uh, and you go, well, that's good. I'm going to eat that again. Yeah, because right. you will feel good if, if you drank it. It's not caffeine. This is cola. This is branch chain aminos. But but if you felt good eating those things, you will seek them out again to feel yeah. good again. Yeah, right. And that's part of the addictive process. Yeah. So you don't want it to make you what if feel it hurts? that good. What if it hurts? Like, you know, there's oh, yeah. a lot of things that people are addicted to that mm. actually hurt them. Yes. And then after they, because of the pain or whatever, they get this extra weirdness out of it you know it's common with things like sex addiction and mm. bizarre sexual addictions mm. and that sort of stuff but even it's linked in with things like chili addiction mm. like things like that that actually hurt things but they you get this exaggerated endorphin because mm. of the pain mm. and you there's a you you I got a paper found on. a paper talking about the addicted brain and how they they have this negative feedback mechanism yeah. that can actually 
block the memory of the painful bit. You know, like yeah. with labor. I don't think anyone's accounts. addicted to labor, but you know, like how you hear people after they've been through <laughs> really painful experiences, <laughs> they remember the joy of the moment yeah. and they, they've forgotten it, how much it hurt. Mm. Exactly. And this is what happens in the brain. In the hippocampus and the amygdala, there's a negative feedback system to your memory, yeah. which means you actually forget about the pain a bit. It's kind of like um, all so this of is what's That's what's wrong with people. CrossFit brains, isn't it? Or gym goers. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. we all go to the gym here. So, And, and it's a painful experience going yeah. to the gym. It is literally... But you physical. remember how good you feel after, after it and you become exactly. immune or resistant to the, the, yeah. the memories of the pain associated with so, it. So people call it an exercise addiction. And, yeah. and in a kind of way it is. It's, yeah. it, it may be a positive one if you're doing the right exercises like you're doing. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I don't know exactly what exercises you do at the gym, but I'm sure it's positive. The most dangerous exercise is none at all. Yeah. So... X, this is actually a positive effect of that memory that's been thing of. However, there are negative inputs of pain. For example, gambling again. I'll go back to that addiction. Yeah. Let's say you go to the thing and you go to the casino and you win $10,000 yeah. over six months. Yeah. You've forgotten about the 20000 20, that you lost. lost. Yeah. Because that seems yeah. to fade. And, and, and you, you talk to people who gamble, even just normal yeah. gamblers, and they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm generally up you know, over my time. I generally yeah. win more. And it's like, yeah. oh, shit. Because... Yeah. How hell are casinos making money if everybody wins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a magic. I know they make it off me. <laughs> uh, people like me, well, Steve. I just that, that, give it to the dealer and go to the bar now. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's a healthy response because uh, you realise that you've made losses and you go, "Well, I'm going to calculate those losses." But some people forget. It's mm. that pain things. Yeah, See, I, was at, I was at the gym this morning. Actually, I was chatting to some guy, and he was saying that he'd already done a whole wad of CrossFit this morning. And I just said, mate, it's pronounced croissant, but how many's in a wad? Six? I've done that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it, it, it actually causes a negative feedback on the, in the addicted brain. It causes a negative feedback. I'm going to test the cameraman here, Vanessa. You can see that little broken line. That means negative effect on your memory via the amygdala and hippocampus. So it actually clouds your memory of the negative experiences. So you end up doing it again. And the guilt. And the remorse and the, and the resentment that yeah. you've had. It, it's kind of like the good old Saturday night. You go out, got blind. No one here, yeah. of course. But, and then you go, oh, I'm never drinking again. Never drinking yeah. again. Yes. Next weekend, what are we doing? Let's go out and get pissed. That's a classic addictive behaviour yeah. where you've forgotten how bad that hangover was on yeah. Sunday. Where yeah. you feel like dying. You know, we've all been there. I haven't been there for 30 odd years, but you, you do remember it. You know, I, yeah. I remember the vomiting and all that sort of thing. And you still go and do it again. I reckon that is involved with, you know, some people get addicted to people. You know, they get addicted really? to exes and they stalk people and stuff yeah. like that. I think they forget the bitch that she was. <laughs> no, no, they forget the pain that they went through. They forget the yeah, bad yeah. stuff and they only remember the good stuff. That happens. So this yeah. seems to be a pattern with mm. cravings and wantings mm. and desires and stuff like that where yeah. the pain and everything mm. associated with it is. It's a an acceptable consequence of getting that reward. Oh. And the more extreme they get with receptor defects and dopamine deficiencies, the the harder it is for them to get that feeling That's right. that they would have had just by seeing a sunrise or something. That's right, because you know? they keep resetting the bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, if, if they, it's like what uh, Steve said. Like if you, you know, they they do something, it makes them feel great. They eat sugar, mm-hmm. it makes them feel great, and they're constantly going to look for that same. Uh, behavior again to get that reward but over time they'll need more and they'll need more yeah. because the, those sudden dopamine surges that they get from the pleasurable behavior resets their bar for mm. um, yeah. dopamine and this is also one of why we have so much relapse you know why uh, with alcohol or drug addictions there's a lot of the therapies are uh, helpful in getting them off it but there's a very very high relapse mm. rate, and it's yeah. because they re, they reward system or their dopamine system is sitting there instead of there. Yeah, yeah. and, and you even not- talk to people and they'll say it's you know I've even got mates that have got some drug problems and funny thing is is they talk about weekends that I was at with them, you know like things that we've done when we we're young that they've never been the same from since they've been chasing that same high ever since. Mm. And it's just like, wow, that was a great weekend. But, you know, like on Monday I went back to work. You know, so, mm. yeah, it's funny how different people, they get that, they get a blast of something. Yeah. And then they can never hit it again. And they yeah. remember that blast. They remember that moment. It might be triggered by a song. It might be triggered by a stress. It might be triggered by something or an event. And they're like, no, I need that thing. So mm. a lot of the things with addictions, you know, in order to break the cycle, 
some people need to totally break the cycle of their whole environment but other people need to just find other things to focus on to get that change in the brain mm. chemistry you mm. know start um and, and it takes a little bit of work because you know you go from mm. an extreme drug effect or an extreme event or something like that with an extreme release of chemistry to then trying to convince yourself that you think this sunrise is so beautiful that it's making me feel a similar way mm. Mm. you've got to do that yourself you know mm. you know you people have got to work this up you've got to kind of Use your facial expressions, use your posture. You, you've got to kind of act it out. And the reality is, is if you do that consistently enough, it becomes your reality. That's yeah. why I talk about your imagination becomes your reality. You could sit there and convince yourself that this is so beautiful, the project I'm working on is so amazing and so powerful and that sort of stuff that all of a sudden you can fill up and alter your brain chemistry by changing your focus and using mm. your imagination yeah. that way. It doesn't have to be. And this is why I hate talking about genetic causes for these things or whatever because mm. even if there is a gene it's no excuse to continue on Absolutely. you have to make that change mm. um and you can still change even if you do happen to have a gene i mean they've mm. always been there so when we're talking about it so far what we've talked about is dopamine defects we said that we could use things like tyrosine but we need to control the pathways mm. that the tyrosine mm. goes mm. down to now that's a holistic approach because mm. the controlling the adrenaline pathway um, is by being anti-anxious. You know, is that yeah. even a thing? It's actually reducing sympathetic nerve activation, which Steve was talking about there, which mm. could be related to the gut inflammation. Mm. Mm. Basically, your body doesn't know what the bloody hell or can't afford to wait to see what a stress is before it reacts. So if it gets a trigger from the immune, the inflammation, temperature, whatever, it's going to manifest a stress response. So you need to take some burden off that by not freaking out over everything mm. else, you know. Um, we then look at dopamine that way. So we've got to control our gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So clostridiums and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff in particular. There's a lot, we have a product called Gut Right, but a lot of those are the polyphenols, a lot mm -hmm. of antimicrobial polyphenols kill off clostridiums. Um, other things that uh, include grapefruit seed extract as well, um, berberines and those sort of things you can use um, to kill off the clostridiums and allow that tyrosine to go down dopamine pathway. Then what we want to look at is these dopamine receptors. So mm. they've been getting smashed this mm. whole time. Yep. So when we bring back these levels back to a normal level, all of a sudden they're not going to register. Mm. Mm. There will be a period of time uh, which it takes for those receptors to upregulate again, to say, hey, where the bloody hell have all my brain chemicals gone? I'm going to upregulate. Now those receptors are typically made of oily, proteiny stuff. So we need, <clears throat> excuse me, we need lots of oil. So our brain is... 80% oil or something, mm. right? It's something yep. stupid like that. So, yep. And all those little antennas are all oily. Okay? Mm. So we need lots of essential fatty acids and not just one or two type. We don't need just EPA, DHA. Even though EPA is the predominant one in the brain, we need all the others to be able to make the structure mm. and actually yeah. hold it because EPA is sloppy. It doesn't yeah. even make a receptor. You need to have some structure with the stearic yeah. acids and all that sort of stuff Central as well. Acid. So a big variety of oils and also working on the, the ways those receptors work. So then we've got all the little B vitamins, mm. all the little enzyme cofactors, the zincs, the magnesiums, the folates, the B12s, along with the other B vitamins are all involved in the way those receptors work. Mm. So before you start any campaign to try to fix your addictions, make sure you are capable of it. Make sure you've got a good nutritional status with essential, uh, essential micronutrients and essential fatty acids to make sure you're capable of doing it. And they've even done one study with um, EPA DHA where they gave one group EPA DHA uh, supplements and they gave another group turmeric. Mm. And the turmeric group got more EPA DHA in their brain than the people taking EPA DHA. So a lot mm. of it's aiding the conversion. In fact, zinc deficiency is a bigger link between your inability to make EPA DHA from your omega-3 precursors. So making sure we don't have deficiencies in zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, upload, you know, using things like turmeric along with all your big mixed variety of oils, mm. and lots of different mm. plant oils mm. and that sort of stuff. And that's probably one of the best ways to make sure your body's capable of rebuilding the receptors. What else can we do in, in that receptor end of the, the game? Is there anything else we can do to help the, and support the receptors from coming back? Well, magnesium helps our NMDA receptors. Uh, magnesium reduces the NMDA receptor activity and the glutamergic activity, so yeah. it helps that with that stress response. Also, what they did in one study was they got rats morphine addicted, okay? Yeah. And they, they then withdrew them and they went obviously nuts. Now, the other group, they got a morphine addicted, same morphine. They administered magnesium at the same time and they were 
much, much better. Oh, cool. So now, obviously, people say, what about humans? You can't give morphine willy-nilly no. to humans. You no. have to go to rats, and this is very interesting. And magnesium deficiency has also been associated with contributing relapses. In, in you know, people go, oh, yeah, I'm off the drugs, and they go back on. Yeah. That's heavily associated with, with magnesium deficiency. Yeah, right. mm. So that, that's what this great new paper came out 2018 magnesium in addiction a general view which is just goes through all the studies on this it's great magnesium is, is deficit involved in addictive substances heroin morphine cocaine nicotine alcohol caffeine and others yeah so well, all of them yeah 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 pretty much yeah. so when you look at magnesium mm. a lot of people mark it as a relaxer it's not so much a relaxant, but just sort of make sure you're capable of switching mm. off. Yeah. So when you get these triggers to say, go, 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 magnesium then comes out to switch off those triggers yeah. and make sure you're capable of switching and go, okay, I heard you, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that's how magnesium probably works a lot. Well, there's, yep. an, there's another mechanism as well because mm. magnesium works on our uh, uh, glutamate receptors, the NMDA uh, receptors. Yes, yeah, I see. And yeah. glutamate itself, uh, if, you, if you're pumping out a lot of glutamate, and you think about MSG, you know, yeah. in, in lots of Chinese food and stuff like that. Glutamate itself, will decrease the production of dopamine mm. but it increases dopamine firing yeah right so it drops your dopamine levels but it makes it, it go it, crazy it kind of, the way i describe it is it kind of irritates nerves it makes them yeah, more sensitive exactly yeah that's why it makes our tongue more sensitive so we can taste more yeah. you know those slow cooked meals that taste so damn good it's mm. because of the liberation of the glutamates mm. yeah. then you throw a bit of the old monosodium glutamate on top of them and it's even better again that's right okay. and the intensity of these flavors it just heightens everything up how does glycine link in do you remember off the top of your head so i know glycine has an effect on the glutamate it um, does uh, affecting with the glutamate yeah, sensitivity. It can dampen yeah. the, that glutamate response, mm -hmm. but I think there is uh, there is also uh, occasions where it can go the opposite. Yeah. It's, a, it's very rare. Yeah. I can't remember the exact mechanism why that happens because in some it can it can create overexcitation. Yeah. But in general, the rule of thumb with glycine is is that it it's more like an inhibitor. Yeah. And yeah. ammonia toxicity too is another one that makes people extremely aggressive and angry, yeah. and it does that by irritate or it's making are more sensitive to glutamic or glutamates yeah. and that sort of stuff as well, huh? Very interesting. So there's Thank a great, you, great diagram here on how magnesium works, and I'm going to show it to the camera because it works in pretty much every negative angle that cocaine does. It works on the opposite effect of. So I love this particular paper, and you can see the nice diagram there, and that's the 2018 paper on magnesium resonance. So yeah, you can see that there, beautiful. It counters it in all areas, counters the brain. It just balances it beautifully, which is what I love about magnesium. So it inhibits, the, the cocaine drives it, this inhibits it. So it has that beautiful balancing effect from about, you know, four or five different mechanisms, which I love. And that, that shows you how magnesium works, also goes back into the brain. So it's a really good mineral to take specifically mm. for any sort of addiction. Yeah. Um, and, and magnesium citrate is, is quite a good one too, they found too in that paper. Yeah, that, oh, that's good to know. Because I was actually curious when you were talking about the glycine, I was thinking in the brain situation, would I be using a magnesium citrate or would I use a magnesium diglycinate but if glycine's a little bit hit and miss I think it might if, be better off with the citrate well or? I think if it's bound to magnesium it, I don't think that'll ever be a problem it's yeah. more if you take like large doses of glycine yeah, singularly yeah, yeah, yeah. so in magnesium I think I would agree probably a magnesium glycinate would yeah. be a really it, would yeah be glycine can go yeah. either way with a magnesium diglycinate for example um, it's a 20% magnesium, the rest is the glycine. So by the time they're taking a couple of hundred milligrams, you're only getting a few hundred milligrams or maybe a gram of glycine. Exactly. Mm. Where it's not there that was much. a trend at, the, at one stage within the industry, and of course we don't like throwing stones and that sort of stuff, but there were some people that were substituting 30% of their protein with pure glycine oh, yeah. because they could still measure it as protein. Yeah. And it's nice and sweet and really cheap. Yeah. So they were, they, they, imagine that sort of situation. You wouldn't even know what's causing the problem yeah. for you. Um, uh, exactly. And just for a little bit of a throw one out there, we, we found recently in a paper um, basically that women are more susceptible to some addictive behaviours. Mm. Uh, and this was published in, in Medicine Clinical in North America, 2019. And it's titled Women and Addiction and Update. So women are much more prone yep. to substance abuse. They've now lessened the alcohol. They think that a woman is an alcoholic if she has seven drinks a week. For men, it's 14. Sounds, it sounds a bit well, sexist. But it is interesting because that could be to do with the COMT enzyme, yes. which is the catecholamine... Methyltransferase. Uh, Catecholamethyltransferase. Yes, that's the one right. I know. I know that one. I know that one. Because when women have, you know, when you have high estrogen, mm. uh, as in, you know, 
you know, when women, when girls hit puberty or mm. women take the oral contraceptive pill or they're just estrogen domin- dominant, that's going to downregulate that COMT enzyme, which is going to uh, prevent dopamine from being metabolized appropriately. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why, yeah, why women get cravings during certain times of the month or they can get a bit yeah. more moody and aggressive. It's because nah. they can get those yeah. fluctuations. Yeah, and that's interestingly, in that <laughs> pre I'm really talking, I'm interrupting yeah. you now, Steve, but good. it's for your own Thank good. Thank you, yeah. Um, <laughs> in that, we got a product that Alpha Venus has got a herb called Vitex. And mm. so the main feedback we get from that is, so we use that to enhance ovulation. You get a good, healthy corpus luteum that makes progesterone but its main effect it's dopaminergic it has an immediate dopaminergic effect and when people use that vitex in that for the premenstrual period the cravings disappear a lot of that weird headachey sort of stuff disappears mm. a lot of the mood changes and that sort of stuff can be regulated yeah. so, and that's all mainly via the dopaminergic and the offsetting of the estrogen with the progesterone which indirectly has a similar yep. sort of effect and they, yeah. they talk about in this paper weirdly women and shopping and makeup and all that sort of stuff and I just skimmed over that bit but but that that's actually associated with dopaminergic release where women seek more dopaminergic mm. release yeah, right. shopping. so you can comment about that I've got, I've got no idea yeah. Oh no, there'd be blokes the same thing. I hate their shopping. dopamine thing. Yeah, I hate shopping not, too. I, I get my addictions in other ways. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there yeah. you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's probably heroin or something, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just other ways. Okay, we, we won't go down that far. Like, uh, where's that white powder? I thought that was protein powder. Yeah, there we go. No. <laughs> so look, it's a, yeah, but but it's very interesting. And, uh, and you know, they, they talk about here with a lot of women and um, a doctor shopping where they, they feel that women do more, and I'll, I'll use yeah. the word doctor shopping, because they don't feel, don't feel satisfied with the doctor giving them the uh, respect. And maybe there's a lot of truth in that. So it's very interesting. And uh, oh, they talk about sense. the cocaine use in women's on the increase. Because we used to have it in the naturopath clinic. We used to have mm. a category of clients called the visitors mm. that mm. would visit every practitioner in town yes. trying to get someone to say what they wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. I thought yeah. they didn't think I was an addiction to practitioners. No. But hey... Um, I was going to say something amazing. I totally forgot with my shitty story. (laughs) Go back to you, Steve. (laughs) All right, look. So so this is the addiction. They're talking about alcohol, substance abuse, about um, in pregnancy, where a lot of women, for example, become full pregnant and they said, no, you've got to give up smoking and they can't. Yeah, right. They can't or, won't, or you know, not one. A lot of they clients really told that the, by the doctor that the, the process of quitting smoking is way too stressful. You're better off just smoking. Wow, there you is go. Is that something that you heard or is that a North Queensland no. strategy? <laughs> I've not heard it, but, yeah. but you know, it... Uh, it, it does, like, you know, there's probably some, some validation yeah. in there. Yeah. Like uh, the stress can often be more detrimental than the, you know, yeah. addiction. I guess it's a bit of a, a way eh? Yeah, a a case one. by case. Hey, um, I've been reading a fair bit lately about ketones and I'm really curious mm. because mm. a lot of this, we're talking about changing in fuel and uh, addic- uh, food addictions. Could we use exogenous ketones to have an effect on food addictions by creating a stable fuel state absolutely. within the brain away from sugar pathways mm, absolutely because that white matter um in the midbrain where the whole dopamine dopaminergic system you takes got white place, matter in your according to steve it's probably <laughs> heroin or a line of coke oh jeez <laughs> there, there i go under the bus yeah <laughs> i did not say that was my addiction <laughs> So let's just oh, talk yeah. about this white substance in the middle of your brain. <laughs> no, no, no. So the white substance in the brain, which is where the dopaminergic system takes place, needs a lot of ATP, a lot of energy, which would tie in with mitochondrial defects, you know, in, in or mitochondrial dysregulation. But ultimately also that area of the brain loves ketones. They do very mm. well on fatty acids and ketones. Yeah. So th- you could theoretically use exogenous ketones, not for weight loss, but for feeding that part of the brain, yeah. which can then improve that dopamine, dopaminergic system, which, which is maybe one of the reasons why ketones often can improve focus and yeah. Um, um, yeah, focus and concentration, which is a, a dopamine function. Mm. Uh, but it could very well start to regulate that area of the brain, which can then dampen addictive behavior and then help the person to get you know, back on track with um, whatever mm. they need to. Because I'm thinking if I'm consuming all these tyrosines and phenylalanines and everything in my meals, <clears throat> my microbiome might be messing up some of it with cresol. I might have other um, <clears throat> firmicutes or whatever, other things that want me to eat sugars. And I might have all those sort of pathways going at once all in my gut where my tyrosine is already hijacked, mm. you know, before I even get to that part. Then I'm looking at this brain chemistry changing and i'm looking at the fact that we're trying to we're getting cravings for for fuel or cravings for 
requirement because mm. I mean you, we talked about the lions we talked about the addictive behaviors mm. of uh, through evolution it was all about mm. survival mm. so like for us to be getting signals that we're not quite right you know we've got uh, we're under attack and it could be just as simple as an overgrowth of bugs you know if, if we're seeing signals of inflammation stress um worry hurry worry money panic we've got an overgrowth of bugs we're eating our tyrosine we're making cresol we're screwing around with our ability to burn sugar as a source of fuel um and um, burn fat and we've got these bugs just telling us to change we've got our brain chemistry that's lacking these chemicals we've got the receptors that have been smashed because of our fun years and that sort of stuff we're pretty much going to be up and down a lot we're going to be going through phases mm. and waves mm. of cravings and you're going to be going through phases of oh man my fuel's here now and i feel amazing and now it's gone and i feel angry or down or you know like mm. and what i was thinking of with the ketones is if there's periods of the day when we're working if we were to use exogenous ketones to keep a steady alternative fuel source so when we have these reactive hypoglycemias yeah. mm. or we have these effects with the glycemic index or an mm. effect from our microbiome we could have a steady source of fuel for our brain that might provide the atp we need to incorporate to rebuild the receptors to do all of these things that we need I, i'm just trying to find some so we've mentioned before that magnesium make sure we got don't have a magnesium deficiency take mm -hmm. an extra magnesium good way to give you the green apple splatters you don't need to do that you need to make sure we're not magnesium deficient same with a lot of the b vitamins you don't want to overload b vitamins because we can your comped pathway you talked about for is a methylation pathway so i don't want to be overloading with things that are going to deplete the methylation pathway we just want to make sure we're not deficient yeah. so with the micronutrients mega doses i don't believe have are necessary often now, most of the time we just want to make sure we're not deficient in these vitamin micronutrients we want to make sure we're not deficient in essential fatty acids we want to make sure we're not deficient in magnesium we've got to cover those things first yeah. we also want to make sure we don't have an overgrowth of gut bugs from everything we've said today it's more likely to be an overgrowth making too many chemicals or an overgrowth making too much lipopolysaccharides mm. and you know t an overgrowth of gut bugs is more likely to become a problem with addictions i mean they're creating their own chemicals telling you to eat things that they love such as sugar and that sort of stuff so more likely not so we want to kill off some of these bag bugs or look at your gut microbiome through a stool analysis or do an organic acid test and th see if things like cresol or whatever's into the urine mm. and that sort of thing and see if we can target the gut so so far my in my brain from what we talked about today a protocol for addictions would include micronutrients um electrolytes oils um and gut gut right gut health sort of mm. stuff things mm. like turmerics and other herbs yep. that will regulate your gut microbiome i haven't done anything yet with brain chemistry Mm. nothing in there that i've said oh, is yeah. actually altering directly directly what we yeah. talk about yeah. being a neurotransmitter modifier can, it, can know, i, can I throw one at you person. yeah throw no you could tell me about all it, right Steve. sure well you mentioned tyrosine a lot we know it's the precursor to dopamine mm. that is a, got a structure of a benzene ring with two hydroxy groups and an amine group out of one group why am i saying it's got one benzene ring because it's a monoamine oxidase so we can inhibit the breakdown of that by using a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Oh. Yeah. A Maui. A Maui. A Maui, exactly. <laughs> so, so there's the monoamine oxidases are used in medicine to yeah. stop the breakdown of these neurotransmitters. Um, and in um, natural medicine, there are certain herbs that do that. Radiol is one of them. Yep, yep. So cool. it would be very good for the, for the stress response of the brain. Do you want and to in the about drugs, you've got effexors and that sort of stuff yep. that protect those. The main difference is, is so the classical antidepressant was a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That's where it all started, I think. Prozac, Prozac is, yeah. and all that yep. sort of stuff. But serotonin um, is not the dopamine. No. Then we want to, dopamine goes down the monoamine oxidase pathway or the COMPT pathway. So we want to inhibit those. And you mm. were saying before, it's a rhodiola. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And that, that's cool about rhodiola because some people find, some, man, rhodiola is the, it's a weird herb to discuss with herbalists. Because they all have a very strong opinion about rhodiola. Oh, you and they, some of them believe it's a full stimulant. You know, for traditional Chinese medicine, yeah. it's a it's a stimulant. You go. And then in the European medicine, it's, oh, it's more of an adaptogen. If anything, mm. it's mildly calming. It's quite amazing to see that you get so... But it makes sense. If you've got someone that's um, down and mm. flat, it because mm. it can preserve the dopamines and everything like that, those people that were down mm. and flat and had a depression born from apathy 
Mm. All of a sudden, they start to feel a bit of something. Mm. You know, so for those people, it's an energy tonic. Yeah. But for other people that have got the excess, it can actually have negative feedback and calm them down. Mm. Yeah. So that's why it's kind of cool adaptogen. If you're up and anxious or whatever, it'll calm you down. But if you're down and def- deficient, it'll pick you up. Yeah, it's a modulator. Yeah. It's a modulator. Yeah. I mean, in medicine, they're rare. This one, uh, Ritalin is a modulator. Yeah, Even right. though it's an amphetamine, yeah. you give it to a child that's hyperactive and it settles them down. Yeah, right. You give amphetamines to probably us that have normal brain chemistry mm-hmm. um, and you, you will be hyped up. Yeah, right. Because it's an amphetamine. You I don't know? think any of us have normal brain chemistry, yeah, just quietly. Right. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. <laughs> but, but for example, radiola, like, you know, you give that, like, that, that's in our quad RX. Yeah. And, um, you know, my wife, Beck, is a nurse. She finishes work at, you know, nine o'clock. It's a very stressful job, of course, dealing with dead people or dying people or very sick people, at least. And, um, of course, she takes that and it calms her down dramatically. Dopamine's also linked in with sleep maintenance, isn't yes, it? So it is. the conversion of serotonin to melatonin with a period of darkness is, I think, yeah. is stimulated by dopamine. So another side effect of or symptom that someone might notice of dopamine deficits is you know poor sleep maintenance, waking up in the middle yeah. of the night with cravings. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Know, so, and yeah. hallucinations and, get, and so stupid dreams. Because if you have too much serotonin, that's like when you're sleeping when you're drunk. Mm. Yeah. And so you get you get those stupid hallucinations where you still think you're at the party and doing all that weird stuff. I would not. And then, oh, man, oh, man, oh, let me tell you some stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, so serotonin, you're stuck there. But if you can't convert the serotonin to melatonin, then you have those stupid, busy nights that you'd never get that full restful sleep. Yeah. And that can be contributing to addictions too because it's one of the main symptoms people talk about is they just can't sleep it's just this mm. constant thing it's killing them sort of thing. Oh, yeah goodness me it's that, interesting eh? that's where another neurotransmitter that calms you down called gabaminobutyric acid is a good calming one to take and that Absolutely. sort of thing too yeah. there's lots of herbs that increase that the gabinergic herbs one of my favorite ones kava i love <laughs> kava um it's a really nice but it's probably addictive itself isn't it is kava addictive because i mean it's I it's banned in a lot of places because of um the because too yeah. many people like it. No, it just makes me very drowsy. Yeah. So yeah. I, it make, gives me that, that, that funny head feeling in the morning. Yeah. yeah. So Numbs my time. Well, we know that the benzodiazepines yes. that work on the gabinergic receptors are highly addictive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so they can be very addictive, you know, to mazepans. And yeah. the, uh, you mentioned um, uh, Craig before, um, who I know personally years ago, who's addicted to sleeping tablets. It's fine. I'm not giving anything away here. But you can become very addicted to a drug called Stillnox, which is a fast-acting yeah, sleeping yeah. tablet, oh, yeah. compared to Mogadon, which is a slow-acting sleeping tablet. It doesn't give you that immediate hit, yeah. but it holds you to sleep a lot longer. And a lot of the body yields use Mogadon because it yeah. drives up growth hormone release, so they get more build. So it's 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 a tricky one. Those sleeping tablets as an addiction because you know Grant probably flying around swimming till God knows what time of night yeah. has to go to sleep. To get up next day, sleeping mm. tablet is excellent for that. Yeah. If you're doing that every night, yeah. you can become very addicted to them. Absolutely. They they say you shouldn't take them more than uh, two weeks, otherwise you get rebound <laughs> insomnia. Yeah, wow. But it's a lot better than what it was in the olden days where Dr. Doug was, was giving um, sleeping tablets oh, many, many yeah. years ago because they were highly... Uh, addictive the barbiturates yeah, which, yeah. Were, which if you overdose on those you'd be it could be fatal yeah, yeah, but if yeah. you have a whole packet of valium you're, you're less likely to die these days it's true yeah and there's a famous thing in the paper about a guy gave powerful sleeping tablets i don't know which ones uh to a nine-year-old and he's you know he's in jail for it for 17 years he's getting released soon and the young girl died oh it's true yeah so he's you know obviously you know terrible terrible situation so Nowadays, those sleeping tablets, while they are less dangerous, can be addictive. Well, the barbiturates were very addictive yeah. too. Yeah, I can imagine. So we've got huge amounts of addictions out there. And these sleeping tablets are pretty much everywhere. It's the first line treatment for someone yeah. with yep. insomnia if you went to a doctor. Absolutely. So sleeping tablets. That gabinergic system is very important because that's what regulates dopamine. Yeah. It's what calms that whole dopamine firing down. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you'll just be on a high the whole time. Yeah. So if you have these uh, addictive behaviors, it eventually will deplete the gabinergic system or, the, or GABA out, out of the um, body. And then you start getting the fears and the phobias mm. and the anxiety and the panic. So that's why you, you get these residual symptoms and insomnia, the sleeping disorders and all of that. Of and I can't think of a better way to increase dopamine in your brain than winning an Olympic gold medal. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that would be the dopamine, dopamine thing. You know, you've strained it all your life yeah. and you win it and it's like you've won. But, but is now, that, that's the problem. So yeah. now what? chasing yeah. it. Now yeah. what? Yes, now Exactly. What? You know, next game's in four years' time. What do you do? You wake up next morning and you, you, you go, oh, I'll just get back to the pool and do yeah. some laps. It's really a, a quite a 
difficult situation to be. It's like the guys winning the footy games yeah. and they seek the dopaminergic things and a lot of the athletes in Australia have had yeah. terrible problems so with drugs and addic- alcohol. Oh, mm. horrendous. You know, one of the yeah. guys always drinking and it's just, you know, the, the guy who got kicked out, his name Farmer, in the news for uh, assaulting his wife at a casino. You know, no, this is a typical yeah, a drinking typical. and casinos mm. are just seeking that dopamine response. It's yeah. quite sad. That was in the news. Yeah. So there's lots of this going around. You've got 150 hours community service or something. So, you know, this is a really terrible situation for these people. And, yeah, I'm sympathetic to them to a degree, but so you can still control them. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the key is... I think, mm. like, with, uh, the first place to start I would would be a holistic approach. I mm. think we need to do the exercise. We've said how important exercise is. Mm. Work out what exercise you love that makes you feel good, that mm. screws with your brain chemistry the right way. Mm. You mm. know, find out what it is, whether it's punching stuff or punching yourself. I don't know. Like, you might find there's distractive ways of doing these things that resemble that yeah. whole hunting, gathering adrenaline, you know? Mm. Um, but it could be the opposite. It could be the total, I just need that peace. I need that meditation. Mm. So someone might thrive with a Ken Ware style treatment. Someone else might need to get into UFC and get hit. Yeah, so find out what it is, but start doing some exercise, you know. Mm. Um, then make sure you're not deficient in things. Just cover the basics. Mm. Make sure we've got all the nutrients capable of healing because you're on a healing journey. So mm. make sure you've got all the bricks and mortar and building blocks you need for that. Then let's start getting some control. Mm. Yes. The first place to get some control would be making sure you're not deficient in magnesium and taking regular magnesium. Maybe even like using some of these exogenous ketones and that sort of mm. stuff throughout the in those flat bits to keep a bit of steady state. That's mm. an interesting theory. That 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 um, make sure as well then that we've got some herbs that will create a little bit of balance around your brain chemistry. So we can use things like rhodiolas and turmerics and mm. chisandras and those sort of herbs and with anias and those sort of herbs that have an adaptogenic effect. Mm. And we could use them throughout the day if you find you're one of those people that get a lot of triggers during the day, that you're under stress, that mm. you're anxious or you feel brain chemistry, you, you need to get your control. You can take that one you know, three times a day, just mm. keep it steady. We can then use other herbs. Um, if you find a definite pattern, if you're a female and finding a different pattern with your menstrual cycle, I would incorporate something like Vitex to definitely control that dopaminergic mm. systems in that, 10 days to two weeks before your period and that sort of stuff in particular, this is all going to start getting us some balance. I would say small regular meals as opposed to... What do you reckon, guys? If you're an addictive personality, you're really going through this. What will intermittent fasting and that sort of stuff do to you? You know, a failed hunting trip really ruin your day? Mm. Because, I mean, that's (laughs) ultimate. If we're going back to evolutionary aspects and saying that, you know, we have these dopamine so we can do extreme things to hunt and gather and that sort of stuff... Does a failed hunting trip really upset you? Well, I don't think it's necessarily okay. that, but if you're if you're already very dysregulated in this mm. in this area, um, uh, uh, intermittent fasting, as much as I love it, it may uh, cause in, in the initial well, stage blood sugar dysregulation, mm, yeah. and that blood sugar dysregulation can then make you. I need to have some, you know, mm. I need to binge on bread or something mm. like that. Yeah. So initially, my experience have been that um, initially you try and get them to go for as long as they can before yeah. it becomes an issue and as they become more regulated mm. they can push more and more but and we more. want this to be it's, it's like a nurturing protocol it's not yeah. like put yourself into rehab and and no. cold mm. sweats and and that sort of shit like no. i mean that's that's like that's based on the assumption that your brain chemistry is messed up yeah <clears throat> and we're going to torture your body until your brain gets its shit together it's not that. You can't separate things. We no. can't separate immune and nerve and gut and skin and all that sort of stuff from the brain chemistry. It's all happening at the same bloody time. Yep. It is. So when you see someone going through such physical withdrawals, there's some physical things we can do. Mm. Yeah. So we can go through and work on So we can be working on the gut. And it's so important when you're trying to break the vicious cycle of addictions is to have a holistic approach. It's, a lot of it is about filling up time and creating a proactive plan. The big point is, is we need to make sure these people have got something positive to focus and something that they're actually focusing on. Like, um, I don't know where this stack come from. I possibly made it up. And no, some dude told it to me and I just accepted it as fact now, I remember. But of two million points of data we could get at any one moment, we take in seven. So we can choose what we want. Now, we can choose. So it, if we just forget about those numbers, they're probably not accurate. But for, we, can, we only can focus on a couple of things at a time. And we will focus on a few mm. things. So it's up to us to force in 
important stuff to yeah. focus on. Mm. So it's up to us to force in things to make sure one of those things is exercise, one of those is gut health, mm. one of those is looking at the nutrients of the foods, the micronutrients, not the macros. Mm. You know, we want to shift our focus and not have those triggers that make us want the drugs or have mm. that brain chemistry that makes us need that reward or stuff that beats us up. We want to have things that make us feel good, strong, confident, and we want to fill up our days and our mind and our routine with positive, constructive things because they will actually take the replace of uh, take the place of your existing addiction. Like if we can switch in a sugar addiction to an exercise addiction, yeah. if we can switch, you know, these things. Because if we've got an, if you're one of those people, and I hear it all the time, I just have an addictive personality. You know, I'll hear it all the time. People say, mm. no, seriously, man, I can't do that. I've got such an addictive personality. If I try that, I'm going to be on it forever. You know, it's like. If you're one of those people, then shift your focus. Mm. Mm. You know, That's a good point. so um, and and just work with it. Just make sure you're addicted to something awesome. Well, it could be anything. It could be you know good, healthy exercise. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but but you talk about balance, and I'll talk a bit holistic here too, because you know. I think if you're, you know, a full-on gun, you know, get a runner or whatever, maybe another thing could be try you take up swimming a little bit. It's a little bit more gentle or walking or, mm. or spending time with a partner or doing something like that just to wind yourself down from it. For me, it's camping. I love camping. You yeah. know, those sorts of things where you're not forced to, you know, if you're walking, you're not forced to go slow, but you typically go slow. Right. Camping is a process, those sorts of things. Um, so it could be whatever you want to do. Yeah. Um, yep. And I agree with you. I think it's, it's great to have that balance in life. Oh, that's Absolutely. right. Oh, I think that's a great way to sort of, you know, almost wrap this up because that, that's really what it's all about. It's about balance. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks everybody, for your, for your time. I know we've gone over time now. We better wrap this up. But uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. It's been a wonderful event, very colourful at, at points towards the middle of the podcast. So hopefully you edited out, Steve, so I don't think we need to acknowledge that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see you again next week. Absolutely. Oh, look, I'm, I think I've said oh, enough for today. Right, yeah, let's go. <laughs> see you later, guys. See you later. But it I think we probably added out my comment. <laughs> What? Fucking that is geez. what. That, no, I said, I said we're going to cut that out. You need to not just cut that out, but you need to burn <laughs> yeah, that, that one. <laughs>